and it's really good for doing that. But it's not good for handling large volumes of traffic for agencies that we might be dealing with, or certainly for sending video back and forth. So here, the mesh network comes into play. The equipment that we use is all made by the Ubiquiti company, and they, they make standard Wi-Fi equipment. But we change that by putting different firmware in it to move it out of the Wi-Fi band into the hand band and incorporate the mesh software into it. So it operates entirely differently from the way it does in its original incantation. The neat thing is when you turn on uh, wireless mesh uh, equipment, it finds everything else and automatically connects to it. The first time I saw this, I couldn't believe it. I had my own mesh node and I went to another guy's house and he had a bunch of mesh nodes and we turned mine on and voila! It, they just all connect all by themselves and you don't have to do anything. Now then the neat thing is, you can connect computers and video cameras and telephones and they all can talk at the same time. Which is really cool because there's nothing we can do with conventional ham radio with repeaters and so on to allow all sorts of things to go on at the same time. We use these low power hi fi transceivers, less than a watt, not because we would like to, but it's because there's no higher power stuff available. It'd be wonderful if we could have 10 watts or 100 watts. We would die for that. But the stuff available is less than a watt. And that makes life very difficult. So you need to have high gain antennas. Now, the equipment. <coughs> I can't reach it from here. Looks like what's sitting out here, these white things. Uh, this white thing here, that white thing over there, it's a transceiver operating at 2400 megahertz. But it has no knobs. Nothing you can external think if you're doing that. Uh, and the other one is what? This one right here? Yeah, that one, that's right. This one is called a bullet. And that one is called a nanostation. That's the name given it by ubiquity. That's nothing that we made up. So they may not look like transceivers, but they are. And it's totally controlled by a PC. So the PC logs into that and controls everything instead of having knobs. And one good thing is, uh, since that's the transceiver right there, the transceiver is what mounts up where your antenna is. There's no coaxial cable, because at 2400 megahertz, you couldn't stand the loss in the coaxial cable. So we run ethernet cable up there, which doesn't have any loss. So this is really great, and a good, way, good, good thing that happens that way. You can go 10 miles or more if you've got good line of sight. It doesn't work well if you have to go through buildings or trees. The signal has to be strong in order to work. Here are some examples up at the top is the bullet that we just showed you right here. And then the nano station is one that's over there. And then the nano station that's over there has a built-in antenna, which is kind of nice because it's just an all-in-one thing. You just buy it and you put it on the air and it works. The antenna is not terribly directive, but it's a maybe 60 degree bandwidth or so. Where on the other hand, with the bullet here, it has no antenna. You have to buy a separate antenna. And this is one example. This is an Omni antenna. This one is a 9 dBi antenna. They have longer ones, about twice as long, that have 15 dBi. That's about as big as you can get. Or you can get shorter ones. And the cost varies depending on how long it is. And this, by the way, just screws right on there. I'll show you in a little bit how that happens. That's the way it always is. No cable. The antenna just always mounts right onto the transceiver. And then we have these various dish antennas, like the one mounted in, in the center and the bottom there. That's the kind that's sort of my favorite, the 24 dBi dish, and the 
Well, it belts right on it, and it costs fifty-four dollars, and that's a pretty darn good antenna. Now, this is a fictitious ham network that you might have, where I've shown stations at various places where we might have them located. The neat thing is, it's self-advertising. As soon as you turn it on, it starts saying, "Here I am, here I am, here I am." And it also says, my call sign is, my call sign is, it's the program into it, so it's automatically identifying itself. You don't have to worry about that. They discover each other. Everything, every station that's within range discovers all the other ones. And it configures itself. It builds tables inside itself of all the other stations that are on there, so it knows all about them. And it's fault tolerant. If one of those stations goes off the air, it doesn't make any difference. All the other ones tech detect that, and they reconfigure themselves, and they change the tables inside, and everything just goes on as before. And everything can be remotely controlled. I could, from my PC, log into any one of those nodes, and through that node, log into any other node, and program it all remotely. So nobody needs to be there. And typically, it's unattended. You just turn all this on, and you just leave it, and it just goes. I mean, it's sort of like repeater in that sense. You turn it on, and that's it. Here's some examples of home stations. The two ones with the dots on there are uh, home stations. Here's the portable mesh note that one of our guys in the Delaware Club did for a special event. He had to be NADRZ. And you see how happy he is there standing in the door of his car. We, uh, we learned some good lessons. We, bought, we put the mesh equipment in a suitcase here that he's got there. And then we soon learned you cannot see the screen of your PC outside. The light just swamps it, and you can't see a blasted thing. So we took, we took that cardboard box, and we used that as a light shield, and you put it in there so you can see the screen of the PC. And over there is one of those dishes that I showed you before. It's mounted on a typical military surplus uh, mask that you can get fairly inexpensively. And if there's any questions, by the way, as I go, just hey, cut in. And this is a mobile installation. In the left, this shows a bullet uh, mounted on a mag mount with a short antenna like that. And on the right, the only thing that's part of the mesh is the PC, the city over there, the seat, the rest of that is other equipment that has to be happens to be in that car. Now, when we're doing this to help other people, for various kinds of officials, it's important to keep in mind what they do in their everyday life. And we'd like to imitate their everyday life and make it as easy as possible for them to use our stuff. So, if they can use a cell phone or a computer or a telephone, that's great. They don't have to learn how to operate our equipment. They just do what they already know how to do. Now the great thing about the telephone situation is, this is all full duplex audio. No push to talk, no answering back and forth. It just all works just like a normal telephone does. And they can talk to whoever they want to. For example, we put speed dial numbers into these telephones, and they have a little telephone book that says, okay, I want to call the EOC number two, and they're called the EOC. And the ham doesn't need to be there to make that connection for them, to call up, make a connection, get it scheduled on the repeater to all that, it just all happens. Now the ham is still there to control things, so the ham is still in control, so this is still legal. And they're all identifying themselves all the time anyway, so there's nothing to worry about that. And the great thing is you can have many telephone calls all going on at the same time. Not tying up the repeater, not tying up anything, just all working at the same time. And of course, we can send video at the same time. And our job is to make it as easy as possible for that to happen. Now using typical stuff that you already have, a cell phone is a ham radio transceiver. It operates on the 2400 megahertz ham band. I don't know if you knew that before, but it's true. A computer like this is a wireless ham transceiver. transceiver. It operates in the 2400 megahertz band. And a telephone can be much more convenient and familiar to speak to a radio than for somebody we're trying to help. 
Now, this is how you connect Wi-Fi to the mesh. We have two wireless routers. The left is called the Wi-Fi wireless router. That's one of those right there that has not been modified. It's got the original firmware in it. Then on the right is a mesh wireless router, which has our special mesh firmware in it. And you connect them with an Ethernet cable, and voila, Wi-Fi is now connected to mesh. You don't have to do anything else. So that means the cell phone over here can connect to that wireless router and go through the little bridge there to the mesh and connect it, say, to a telephone or something else on the other side. I'll show you a little bit more how that can happen. We can also then connect it to our favorite radios and repeaters. For example, if we have a mesh node connected to a PC, we can use a signal link interface. How many of you have a signal link interface or know what it is? Yeah. It's a standard box that many people use to connect computers to radios. So in this case, we could use that interface to connect to our transceiver, which then goes out to simplex and computers of all kinds. So that means over here, anything that's in the mesh cloud, like a telephone or a PC or anything, can be talking on the repeater or to simplex radios on the other side. And this is a, a complicated situation where I put all that together. Both kinds of translations are taking place here. I've got the signal link down here connecting to the radio. Up there, the Wi-Fi in the middle is talking to the mesh bullet on the other side. And everything is all connected together and talking to each other. The thing that makes so much of this possible is the Linfone software. It runs on everything. And it's free. It does audio and video and a three-way calling and all the things that you would normally would like to do. And you can just download it and it just works. And this is the Linfone world, where we can have a Wi-Fi wireless router in the middle connected to the mesh radio cloud. All those kinds of computers and cell phones all talk to each other. No internet, no service providers, no cell towers, no wires. It's all free. Now, one of the things we've done with the cell phones is program the, the image that's on the front. So this is a cell phone that you might hand to somebody, say, here, use this to talk. You want to pass this one around? This is one, and, it, and I, it's a slightly different, but you can see that we've programmed it on there, so it makes it much more attractive. And you don't have to have modern cell phones to make this happen. A way this might work in a uh, large-scale disaster scene as we might be out here uh, at the scene of the event and with those, several of those cell phones connected to the mesh Wi-Fi repeater going over the mesh to, say, the EOC, where we could have our mesh node, we could have a bunch of telephones, uh, we could be sending video, we could have a large screen display, and we could connect it to the repeater at the same time. How do you connect the telephone to the mesh? Well, you use a ground, grand stream adapter. Could somebody help me for a minute here? Take that box in the middle there. That little box, it's, yeah, right there. That's a grand stream telephone to Wi-Fi adapter. A telephone to, well, okay. That happens to be a one telephone box, which is called the HC701. You have a two or a four, which does two phones or four telephones. <coughs> you just plug it into the mesh node, like that's plugged into the mesh node over there. You plug it into any analog telephone, and it just works. And you can make telephone calls via that little box right there. OK, thank you for the moment. <laughs> You could use any telephone, but I strongly recommend that you use AT&T telephones like that one because you want to be able to do speed dialing. If you can't, if you don't do speed dialing, you have to do what this long string of stuff is here is at the bottom. Because you're talking to that box in its language, and that's the IP address of be 10.41.145.233, but there's no dot on the telephone 
pad, so he uses stars instead. And star 47 is the command to that box saying I'm ready to make a telephone call, and pound sign at the end says make the call now. Well, that's a pain to try and remember all that, or even to show people that. And I tell you, I can't even dial it very, very accurately myself, because you make mistakes. So, you want to program it into a memory key that's in there. And only the AT&T phones that I've been able to find have a speed down memory that's long enough to get all those numbers in there. All phones have speed dials in, but they don't have enough digits that you can program all that in there. So that's why I recommend the AT&T stuff. Or, instead of doing that, you can use a phone like this here, which is an all-in-one telephone, an IP phone, also made by Grandstream. Happens to be the 1630. I'll tell you more about all those in a minute. This is the setup I have right here. On that side over there, there's a power supply for the mesh node. Uh, this is power over ethernet, or PoE, where it sends the power over the ethernet cable, in addition to the data being sent over the ethernet cable. So you don't need any separate power cable. And that's what that box, black box is over there somewhere, which is connected then to the Grandstream telephone box, which I showed you there, and it connected to the AT&T telephone. That has to be a black one, that has to be a white one. Another, the other example is, I've got set up over here, use the ubiquity bullet, which I showed you, which is connected to its PoE box, so that it gets power to run. Then it plugs into the telephone, which is that thing right there. And now the neat thing about that is, a telephone has an extra Ethernet port on it, so that I can plug my PC into the telephone. Otherwise, I would have to use an Ethernet switch on that other side over there to be able to plug in the PC. And they're talking to each other over 24 megahertz. I'm going to show you how this all works. In fact, why don't we just do that now? Could I have two people who, who could do their best imitation of Vanna White please come up here? <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to be Vanna. Okay. Ken is Vanna. I'm Pat CJ. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now I'd like one of you to. Take this black telephone over here, and when, I, when, you're, when you're listening, please tell the people what you're hearing. So okay. pick up the receiver. Dial tone. Aha, uh -huh. so you dial tone Ooh. already. Not, not from the phone company, though. Right. Now push the key, the bottom key on the right-hand side. Let me see what. Okay. Bottom key way over there. Oh, it's not. Push that. Okay. Answer the phone and tell me what you hear. Hello. Hello, Vanna? Yes. <laughs> I, hear Brian. I hear Brian. That's awesome. Yeah, definitely. This okay. is clear. Absolutely crystal clear. Very now nice. You're yeah, going over nice. 2400 megahertz right now between these two. There's no, there happens to be a power wire, but there's no wire. No. And I did not screw on the antenna because at this range we don't need the antenna on here. Nice. Power phone mesh node. Yeah. How about that? Phone, Ethernet. Okay. Okay, you can hang up now. <laughs> Bye. Okay, now I want you to pick up the phone and tell me what you hear. Dial tone. Okay. Push M1 and then keep telling us what you hear. Your touch tones. Okay. <laughs> what about that? I wonder if Van is calling. <laughs> Hello? Hello? <laughs> Are you home? Oh. Hello? There you are. <laughs> hey, you know, that's a common problem we found on our first-gen Cisco phones is the little hang-up thing would hang up and <laughs> you had to do that. So, yeah. 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 Very good. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, loud, clear, no, just like you're at home on the phone. Wow. Awesome. Okay. I like it. Okay. Well, let me just do a little song and dance here. And then I'll kind oh, of the phone's down. over. This is a comparison of these two approaches to telephony here. The adapter plus the telephone is over there. It's a less costly approach. And to expand it to more phones is even more less costly. A one 
thing you have to keep track of, that phone takes internal batteries in order to keep the display going. And if you don't use that phone very often, the batteries die out and they corrode. And it wrecks the inside of the telephone. I know I had a trouble with that telephone yesterday when I was trying this out. I had to clear out all the corrosion in there. And then around this one has no internal batteries. That runs off a of 12 volts, which is good. This runs off a of 5 volt, which is not as convenient. You have to have a wall wart or some other thing. That has a very useful PC port over here because now, let's say you've got some telephones out there in the field that there is people set up and you don't know what the address is and they're not programmed yet for to have the, the, uh, the speed dials. So I can sit here from my PC and connect to any of those telephones out there in the field to program the speed dial numbers. So then anybody can know what number to push, one, two, three, four, where it goes to and what's, what it happened, well, how it happens. Whereas programming the, that telephone over there, you have to do it by pushing numbers in, in the keypad and it's harder and you often make mistakes. So that's just two different approaches to doing telephony. And there's one more. Oh, I made a suitcase that has in it four telephones and a four telephone adapter, just as the kind we sold here with a bullet, and you can carry it around. And so that's something you could take someplace and just set down, like in an EOC or something, and you'd have four telephones. So four people could be talking on the telephone at the same time. I put extension cords on the telephones so they're not right next to each other, so they can be different parts of the room. More information about the mesh stuff you can get at that, that location. Other examples are here. Okay, I gotta show you one other thing now. Well, I'll do that later. This is the map of stations in Delaware County where the red dots and the red stars are st uh, mesh stations that we have on top of the 911 towers. We have permission to put uh, mesh transceivers on all the 911 towers. And we've done that with some of them already. Now the three at the top we have not done yet because we don't have the money. Our biggest expense is they require us to have a certified tower climber. So that costs a lot of money every time you want to have a mesh node put up on the top of the tower. When you say 911 tower, you mean the Marks towers? Yes, I do. The one down here in Lewis Center, we're waiting for spring because that's when we can get the tower climber to climb up the tower and do something. The one that'll be closest to here is the one over at Ostrander. And uh, it's like 150 feet in the air. It has an Omni antenna on it. I don't know if you can reach there from here or not. If you've got a high antenna with a dish, a high dish antenna, you might be able to connect to us. I don't know. This uh, is an application we did last year. It's called the Ironman Triathlon. They want to have video from three locations. So we had video from these three locations, and, and this was in the EOC. Uh, we can do that so much better now. It's really clunky the way I had to label those. They had to run actually three different instances of the browser to be able to see it on there, and it's just horrible. But it worked. Now I have much better software where I can really have those windows nicely on there and label them nicely and not have, not have all that baloney. Okay, we already did that demonstration. Now I'll do one more demonstration here. I, I remember I talked about Linfo. If, if you will, I copy the slides. You know, just let me know. Now, let's see what I can do here. I can't see it too well from down here. <coughs> well, I guess it's not going to work. I did something wrong. Anyhow, this is Linfone. 
And this is how it works to connect to both of the telephones, but I can't because I connected something wrong. So that's the end of that. I don't want to take the time to try and figure it out now. So now, what questions can I answer? I thought on your first slide you said it didn't do video. Very first slide, you said it doesn't do video. What did I miss in the transition? Uh, no, what, what I said was our normal networks don't do video. But this uh, does do video. Okay. <clears throat> I didn't bring that along because there's, there's more stuff I'd have to drag along to demonstrate that. But you can use a standard video camera, you know, a webcam. It connects right into there, right into the uh, node. And it sends live video wherever you want to send it. That's pretty cool. I, I've since learned that there's a much better software called AnyCam available, which costs $12, which displays all the windows very nicely, you know, the Hollywood Squares kind of thing, and you can put labels right in the video, and it works so much better than what I did before. Yes, what was your question, Ken? Um, I see everything you're using is ubiquity, so all that old generation, WRT42, all that stuff is old technology, right? Yes, it is. Everything's ubiquity. Yes, now when this started out, we were using, uh, what's, the, what's the brand name for the stuff that you're mentioning? The Linksys. The Linksys. 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 Linksys stuff, Linksys. that's right, Linksys stuff. Uh, well then, eventually it was realized that that has a number of limitations. So the, the, the power, the transmitter power is much less in ubiquity boxes. Uh, they cannot be programmed to operate outside the handband, like the ubiquity boxes can. So you get terrible interference from Wi-Fi <coughs> signals if you try to do that. So that's what drove the change, to do everything on ubiquity boxes. So we don't use any of the Linksys boxes at all. And it was too bad I got a bunch of them at home. <laughs> Now, do you get most of the ubiquity stuff off of uh, commercial vendors, or? Yeah, you can buy it over the internet. Amazon has it. Okay. There's a company in Pennsylvania that sells used stuff. Uh, the software, I mean, the firmware to change it over to the mesh way of doing things is on the AREDN website. You have to be very careful what you're doing there. You can wreck your stuff without too much trouble. So you want to pay attention to the instructions. Yes. You said that if we had uh, <clears throat> something here that we could connect into the one like at Ostrander. Yeah. And um, so we would be connected into you guys in Delaware's network. What kind of issues does that raise or cause or uh, like is there security, is there passwords, is there something you can keep um, from sharing everything or is everything open to everybody? Is that Basically mean? everything is open to everybody. Okay. If you don't want to connect then you just don't connect. Okay. But essentially having a few guys were connected it's just like having more stations in Delaware County. It just doesn't matter. You know, All the nodes can talk, talk to all the other nodes. Is Delaware connected to Franklin County? No. No. Any plans for that? Or? It's been discussed. <clears throat> There's one node in Delaware County on top of the state office tower that we can reach from the southernmost node here. But there's no other connectivity to, the, to the Franklin County. So would there be an advantage to if, if there was a group in Franklin County to do that, or was it better just to keep it within Franklin? Well, it's just entirely your choice. I mean, I think it'd be more interesting to have more stations connected. Okay. Hey, we here at Beauty County have been contemplating that for some time. We have access to a water tower. We've been thinking about putting a unit up there. Just haven't gotten that far. It's hard, you know. You just need all the antenna gain, and all the height you can get. It's just hard to make it work right. 
Yeah, we've got about 180 feet. We already have one of our repeater receiver antennas up there. Uh -huh. So your central place, like if we put one on the, let's say our water tower, it would be an omnidirectional, and then you'd have other uh, in the surrounding, and they would have like directional antennas. If, if, if they need to to get to that station. Okay. Right now, our guys who are out in the field, they don't have directional antennas because they're close enough to some tower, someplace that they can get into it. And if we could get into one. To Delaware County, like you said, Oakstrander, yes. then we would have access to yes. to all of them. So. That's right. Then you and have if, access. if Franklin County got connected, then it would be the same. Yep. The same and way everything, we everything would Franklin. be connected. That would be great. And I would talk to the people in Madison County last month about the same thing. If we could get them connected, that would be great. Do you have any of your um, the mesh nodes that are set up in Delaware, do they have internet access at all? No, we do not have internet access. Now that's not difficult to do. A lot of mesh nodes around the country do have internet access. Right. And there's a software that, that from AREDM that makes that possible. So one of the mesh nodes need to have, needs to have internet access. And then they all do. And then you need to control that with passwords and so on, so that not just anybody can be doing that. Right. Well, those things speed in would be cut down by how many would be connected at the same time. Probably only one. I maybe not. I don't really know how that works. I just haven't looked into that. But no, you're probably right. You can probably have multiple stations connected at the same time. Uh, and that brings up a. a something that I'm curious about, which is the operating rules, right? So, I mean, if we if the mesh network is up and you're connected to the internet, non-hams can use the network. That's permitted under the... No, 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 you have to clarefully control that. Okay, okay. You'd have to have a gateway that, so a ham would have to log in and be controlling it from his location. <coughs> yeah, and yeah, effectively what this all is, as far as security, I mean, this is essentially equivalent. If you just ran cables to all these places and plugged them into a switch, oh, I understand that. That's what it. That's what it essentially looks like from an architecture standpoint. Absolutely. It just the cables are are two and two and a half gigahertz mesh wireless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The only time that well, someone other than hams can operate things is if somebody's operating a telephone or operating a video camera or something. As long as the ham is somewhere there keeping track of what's going on, then I say let them do whatever they're going to do. We don't need to be pushing every button and doing everything for them. That's a heck of a mesh trustee that would be. <laughs> um, this, uh, another thing comes to mind is uh, how scalable is the uh, routing protocol? Uh, how many nodes can it support? Is it uh, Oh, extremely large number? Yeah, how big is the, ta the node table in each, yeah. in each bowl? I think it's a large number. Mm -hmm. I, I'm on the mailing list of the ARDN who does the software and so on. I've never heard a discussion of people running out of space. Right, right, right. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen, mm -hmm. but I've just never heard of it. Okay. Again, and Paul, in your scenario, the only downside would be if you only have one link into the mesh network. If that link fails, you don't have an alternate path to get somewhere. So being connected to multiple nodes would be an advantage for resiliency anyway, right? Yeah. And that could be as simple as his suitcase. Yeah. You sit that someplace and plug it in and you've, you've got connection into the nest from wherever. Absolutely. And the really cool thing I saw in here was uh, in the car, <laughs> right? Wow. Now you're, uh, you're a roaming connecting, connecting point. That's kind of cool. I want to show you that all of these boxes here have web servers built into them. Yes. Telephones, the telephone interface, both of the wireless nodes, you can log into all of them. And that's what you do, and that's the way you set the parameters and control everything. Right now, I am connected to this guy right here, the bullet. And uh, I don't expect you to understand all the stuff that's 
says right there, but there's all sorts of interesting stuff. I'll show you a couple of interesting things. In the single to noise ratio here, I can make a chart. Yeah. The signal to noise ratio between these two antennas here. And so the noise, the noise is down there at minus 95, and the signal is up there maybe 50 or so. So we got like 45 dB of signal to noise ratio, which is pretty good. That doesn't even have an antenna out right there. And so you can do that. This is nice to tell over the air if you want to know how good a signal is coming in. This way you can tell. This is useful for aiming your antenna also. Yes. I should have done that. So, so I, I have a, this is a basic and silly question, but uh, it operates on channel two? Uh, minus two. Minus two. So it's minus two outside the Wi Fi band. Outside the Wi Fi band, right. That's critical. Yeah, but it has to be in the, in the hand band. Yeah, you know, see, the hand band overlaps the Wi Fi band, but it also extends further down okay. than the Wi Fi band. Okay. So we go to channel minus two, which is as far away as we can get. Because okay. the Wi Fi interference is terrible everywhere you go. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in Delaware, uh, Delaware County, the um, okay, this is amateur, but does EMA interface with it? You said it's connected into the 911. It's not connected tower. in. They it's allow us to use towers. their towers to put our nodes on. Oh, okay. There's no okay. interconnection. But does the EMA, point. do they use this for any of their communications or is this strictly uh, amateurs that no, are... No, we work with them. Okay. And uh, we're there to help their needs. As a supplementary communication. Yes, uh, as a backup right. communication. Back up, right. well, well, something we've talked about doing it here is, is we were, our EMA does a lot of uh, support of the local fire and stuff. So if they're, say, at a hazmat site, we could beam live video back from that site. Yes, can that's we, a wonderful thing that, that nobody else can do. No other agency can typically do that. Right. So years, you, years ago, we had a, out here at Raymond, we had a simulated airplane crash. And at that time, one of the amateurs had a uh, uh, video uh, um, yeah, TV, it, it, ATV, yeah, right, it was amateur fast television, scan video. and he was up, yes, and we yeah. had a camera up there, and we transmitted that, you know, back to the EMA yeah. uh, headquarters, so that you know we have live live uh, video from what was going on out at the scene in Raymond, and back here to uh, to Marysville. So, but that was rudimentary, you know, yes. way back then, an ATV, yeah. I mean, this would make it just... But this would be, this would be, this really would be the equivalent of your webcam there watching it in the ECC 20 miles away. Paul, well, does the uh, bus have a camera on it? Yes, yes. and it is, it so is we, a... It and is that's a, what we've been trying to it is an figure out camera. the format and everything that... So uh, that we could hook it to this, get a mesh set, of, set up on the bus if Possibly. we could get the form, if we know, if we yeah. know what the format they're, they're of the being video very is, right? it's it's a it's an IP <clears throat> camera, but they're being very close source on what the format, whether you use an MPEG or how they're formatting in the packet. That's something that we yeah, we got we a TV camera on the bus that goes up, extends, cranks up to like uh -huh. I don't know, fifteen, twenty feet above the bus, and you can rotate it and. That's angle cool. it and all and that stuff. Him. So yeah, if we can it, figure it, out. That's it, what we. Yeah. One of the things we've been working with is trying to figure out the, the video and how we can, you know, transmit that, you know, back someplace else. Yeah. So great. The camera manufacturer doesn't have a video codec. No, yeah. it, we, we I, I looked up the camera manufacturer and the, the video mm -hmm. the DVR they have with it, mm -hmm. and it, it's just digital. They don't mention MPEG or anything. It's just it's just digital IP, and. I couldn't find anywhere that they listed what the content of the packets look like. Right. So, so they're being, they're, I don't know if they're doing it on purpose or, or just they hadn't thought about doing it. But. This is another window, which is kind of useful here. Over here, it shows the DHCP addresses that are reserved. Now, I haven't talked about how this network actually works. The 
bullet in this case, or the nanostation over there contains the DHCP server. So it supplies the addresses to everything else in the network. If you have anything else in the network that wants to supply addresses, you have to turn that off. Because you can't have multiple devices providing addresses. So when I'm logged into this guy here, he's the one that provides the addresses. And so it has reserved an address for this, which is the GXP 1630, and it has a reserved address for the PC. Because this is the two things that are plugged into it. If there are other things connected, then you would see it at this point. I can show you something that's pretty tricky here. Oops, too far. Now if I go to mesh status, that tells me everything that's on the mesh network. So it says I'm over here, I'm a local host. Here are the current neighbors that I can see. And that one over there is WADRD Nano Station. If there were other stations within range, they would appear here too. And then I could see all the other stations that were on the network. And now if I click on this guy, ta-da, I'm now logged into that guy over there. And I can do everything over there that I wanted to do to control him. And so the same way, you can log into any other station that's on the network and change parameters or update the software or do whatever it is you want to do. Can you do file sharing between? <coughs> yes, if you have <coughs> software to do that, you just need file sharing software at each end to make it, and then it's just a transparent connection. You think of each of these as a switch port. So if you want file sharing, you have to have like a, 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 a network file server plugged in. Or just share out a folder on your Windows machine. Yeah. And I could drag and drop to your machine. Yeah. Right. And 14 right. megabits, which I saw on the last screen, that's way faster than uh, JT65. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, I had to say that. Yeah. You know, paint dry and you mean. <laughs> Still yeah, fun. It shows, Still it shows the speed on there too if you're on the right one. Yeah. You picked up on that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very good stuff. Very good stuff. Except my wireless uh, sniffer is not going to see any of the uh, traffic, the control frames on the uh, ne channel negative, too. So, right now. No, probably not. Do you have to select the channel on it? No, it's promiscuous. But I don't know. That it's not going to look down there. The yeah. Might not go that far. Yeah, that's interesting. Hmm. Well, if you uh, want to copy the slides or you have any other questions, you know, or anything, you can always just call me up or talk to me. Yeah. Appreciate it. Sounds yeah, thank good. You. Uh, very informative in the. Or try to set anything up, you know, or maybe have trouble making anything work, you know, just talk to me. I might know the answer, I might not. Okay, but, but Bob, what's your email address? My address is w8erdbob at gmail.com. W8erdbob at gmail. No A double R L, huh? Okay. I always write on people for that, but that's. <laughs> <laughs> no. I have it, John. I never check it, though. So I could have mail there. Well, mine. You don't have no idea. What do you mean there? Yeah. It, it's it's a oh, forward. No, you forward it. If you to forward it, then oh. it's not it's not a mail account. Oh, okay. It's a forward account only. Yeah. Well, and go to 